Peace, what's happening? Shalom, Hotel. How y'all feel? This your boy Kansu, Sheshmu, Amun. And once again, Team Osiris is on the internet, beaming hard, coming with real information, true scholarship, and just downright a good time. You know, I kind of I kind of feel that way today. And uh, we're go- the subject matter is going to be Arisha's versus the net to do. I want to give a big up to my man, Anka Keck, Amon Ra Squad, all of those cats. Thank you so much for yes, sir. Up. Um, the, uh, the, the, the support. Hold on. We got some feedback here. Hold on. All right. Now we could. Um, I want to thank the support from Mama Ra Squad. You know, we love them and they love us back. You know what I'm saying? We all family. So it's one love to them. And we got, of course, this goes without question, an esteemed member of Team Osiris, um, the brother Benjamin, who we call the Black Panther, who is going to kind of, you know, drop a couple of bombs here and there and, and give us some information on the Orishas versus the Netaru. I do want to say this. I've heard some things rumbling on the internet about Team Osiris. And how we are the backbone of Amira squad. And let me make something clear. We all family. Ain't nobody going nowhere. Nice try. I know when you got the dream team and you got the best of the best, you're going to have the haters coming out the woodwork. It ain't happening because we family. We all about black African power, uplifting our people. Oh. And we're going to support Amira squad to the end. So ain't nobody yep. going nowhere, kid. So just get comfortable, sit back and relax and deal with the onslaught. Either you're gonna get out yes, the later. Sir. That's just how it is. It ain't even that's not even shout out to the hard color, Gozi, <laughs> the Magi, Yawu, Nahisi, the whole family, man. Big shout out to them guys, man. What up, Nahisi? No we are family. That's right. All day. What up, Jackie? You don't think I forgot about you, old Jackie? Sir. What up? So I, I want to clear that up. And also, anybody who seems to, to tends to think that is sweet with Team Osiris and Amara Squad, gladly email us. Let us know what you want. You might want to discuss, or if you just have the gumption and want to debate about something that, uh, for some reason, you think we're not speaking truth. Um, it's not about ego. We just about setting the record straight. So we have nothing to hide. We just deal with the information. It's not us personally. This is what we feel empowered to do. But I'm yeah, black shoulders and I'm going to get a floor to you right now, man. Let everybody know what time it is and, you know, kind of break down the net to do and the you know, Arisha from your perspective. Um, and let's get it in. Okay. Uh, peace, everybody. It's Black Panomi. It's Ben, you know. Just chilling on this Wednesday night. Wanted to drop some information on y'all. I'm showing my camera because a lot of people was asking me, you know, I guess my Facebook picture is uh, kind of uh, not telling of how I look. So this is how I look. So nobody can say that I'm hiding or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> I go by Black Panther, not the Black Panthers of Huey P. Newton or anything like that. I go by uh, Black Panther as a uh, kind of a association with the comic book character. If you don't know who Black Panther is in, Mar- in Marvel Comics, I suggest you read it and it'll uh, actually see how the creator of it had a great reverence and respect for Africa. So that's where my name comes from. That was another question I got. So that's where my name comes from. B-L-A-K Panther. So now you know. So I'm turning my camera off now because y'all ain't gonna be looking at me the whole time. <laughs> now we can get into some some knowledge. Tonight's topic is going to be entitled Orishas versus Necharus. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because we know Kemet's popular. We know Kemet is the zenith. We know Kemet had a great Nile Valley civilization. But there are other spiritual systems in Africa that we don't talk about, that we don't uh, convey as much as we do 
Kemet. And I want to break down another spiritual system, uh, their version of the Necherus. This would be Ifa. And uh, the way the Necherus were in Kemet, they had Orishas in Nigeria. Now, I want to read, I'm reading from this book called The Way of the Orisha by Philip John uh, Neomark. And the preface is by Dr. Afolabi Ipega. And that is actually a, uh, an Ifa name. So he has to be a Baba Lao to so even obtain that name. I want to read something from this book. It says, well, let me find it real quick. It says, of creation of the earth and specific natural forces involved in every human way to anthropomorphize these forces to make them into understandable human forms with human traits. And he's talking about what they did with the Orishas. Now, this is going to uh, sound familiar to a lot of people that study Kemet. Because as we know, Asar, Aset, Heru, Ptah, uh, Ra, all of these uh, Necherus are anthropomorphized as well. And some of them have uh, zootites in which they represent natural forces. So the people in Nigeria of Ifa thing to their natural forces or their divine spirits as the people in Kemet did. So I wanted to get that point out from the get go. I'm going to be going over some more similarities between these people right now. I want to read page seven. And page seven is uh, basically covering the 16 truths of Ifa. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to read a few of them here. One, they have a single high power. Now, if you study Kemet, you'll find uh, Nebatesha. He is the single high power in Kemet. And every other Necheru is a form of him in some sort of way. So they have the same type of system in Ifa. And I'm going to go into that a little more in detail when I talk about Uludamare, which is the supreme uh, deity in Ifa. Another point they have on here is number five. It says you should grow and obtain wisdom during the process. Now, everybody knows in the uh, secret system of the Shishata, or the mystery schools, they had to obtain wisdom to be able to advance in the temple of Ipatasut. So it's the same premise here. You have to obtain that wisdom during the process, and the process is you shaping you into being the best person or divine, close to the divine spirit as you can be. Uh, number 10 says, you must never harm the universe of which you are a part of. Now, this speaks directly to uh, one of the laws of Ma'at. Uh, I believe it's law of Ma'at 24, where it says, I will not pollute the earth. Law 16 that says, uh, laying waste to the plow land. So those laws are uh, given an indication of you can't do things to your natural world because your natural world is as much a part of you as you are a part of it. So this is the same concept we see and uh, number 10, where it says you can't harm the universe because you're a part of the universe. So we're seeing similarities here. Uh, number 13 says, and must be honored. This is the same premise that we see in Kemet, deifying ancestors, ancestral worship, uh, not just throwing them aside like we do in a uh, Western culture, but having reverence and respect for people that came before you and you know laid the path for you so this is the same thing in kemet that we see in nigeria with the ifa people uh in the ifa tradition they have what's called babalaos babalaos would be equivalent to your uh kari head priest or uh visor or uh, that title in kemet and basically these are the priests the keepers of the uh spiritual system. They perform the rituals, uh, divination, uh, they make other priests, they give readings, things of that nature. So we know in Kemet, the priests had to go to uh, school for 40 years before they became a Kari head priest. Baba Laos don't go for quite that long, but it is an extensive study and they have to memorize many of what are called Odus, 
Uh, Odus are basically classifications of different Orishas because when they're giving these readings, they have to determine what your head Orisha is. So they basically have to memorize these different categories that will align you with a different Orisha. So it's a very extensive study and uh, not easy by any stretch of the, of the imagination. I'm going to move on and read some more of this passage where it says on page 18, where it talks about we don't steal or have sexual relationships with our neighbor's mate because if we did, we would create or perpetuate a climate in which our own property, our mate, is fair game to others. Now, we all know Law of Ma'at 2 says no stealing. Law of Ma'at 20 and Law of Ma'at 21, which, which reads, uh, I will not copulate with another man's wife and I would not copulate with another woman's husband. So right here, we're seeing the same basic principles, uh, not to steal, no adultery, no, anything like that. And there are many similarities between these, uh, these cultures. Another one is uh, the afterlife. Uh, in Ifa is called Ikel Orun and Kemet is called the Amduat. So, you have a concept of a life after Earth or after this uh, plane that we're on right now. And both of these cultures really revered and uh, respected that principle. And they did rituals to basically honor their ancestors that are in the Amduat or the Ikel Orun. Uh, days of the week from studying the solar and lunar calendar of Kemet you will see that uh, they name different days of the week after, of the week after uh, Netcherus. Same thing that you find in Ifa. They name their days of the week after their Orishas. And every day has a different uh, Orisha, and every day uh, ends with that Orisha and rises with the new Orisha. And the same thing with the uh, solar and lunar calendars in Kemet. Uh, the words, you find two words that are similar as well. Uh, Edan in Ifa and Heka in Kemet. And both of these words mean like power or magic. And uh, you'll find these words in these two separate cultures, but they mean the same thing. Uh, a, a spark of power, a spark of uh, magic, a, a force that could control things. And they're very uh, well reverend in both uh in both cultures. Um, I believe there was even a king called King Heka in uh, Kemet. And in uh, Ifa, there is uh, many people with Edan in their name. More similarities would be the great sense of family. Uh, as we know, uh, Ramesu, uh, Ramesu II, or Ursa Ma'at Rasa Tepan Ra Ramesu Mary Amen, the second. He had over a hundred children. I believe it was 121, uh, if my memory serves me correctly. And that's basically around the principle that the children not only are our future, but they are a blessing from the uh, from Nebatesha or Ra or Amun Ra or Ptah or whoever is ruling in this different solar cycle. It's the same thing in Ifa. Kids are described as the greatest thing or blessing one can ever have, and one that has kids are like put up in society. They have a sort of a rank over the people that do not have kids because they're such a blessing from the great deity or the great force. So again, the same principle, you'll see it over and over. Uh, both cultures had a great appreciation for love. Um, they even named two deities after this. Uh, in Kemet, it's Het Heru, which is described as love or feminine love. In Ifa is Oshun. Oshun is the goddess of love. Without her, the world doesn't revolve, the world doesn't spin. And you'll find that specific, uh, I wanna say dictation in a lot of Orishas because it's a balance factor. If one Orisha doesn't do their job, the whole world spins out of whack. For example, Ogun is the god of war, technology, and iron. There's a story where Ogun goes into the forest 
And when he goes into the forest, the whole world is on the brink of collapsing and shutting down. He gives up on man and he goes into this forest and he's like, you know what? I'm tired of it. I'm just going to live in the forest. So the mortals, they sent Oshun after him because without technology, without iron, without the ability to go to war, the tribes would collapse. Everything would spin out of whack. So they sent her after him. And she is known for having a pot of honey and doing a sacred dance. So she started doing her sacred dance with this pot of honey. Ogun was naturally attracted to this dance. So he started looking, he started peeping through the trees and she kept doing her dance and he kept getting closer and closer. Now she knows he's there, but she's not going to say anything. He gets closer and closer until he's right up on her. And then she rubs some of the honey on his lips. He falls in love. He decides to give man another chance. The world spins again. Same principle of balance that we have with Ma'at and the scales of Ma'at, the truth, the justice, the righteousness. The world does not go forward without Ma'at. We know that uh, studying Kim extensively. So it's the same concept and same premise in the two uh cultures and i and i can hear ngozi saying right now i'm telling you that's because the niger congo came to kimmy and they were the pyramid build i mean i can hear him right now <laughs> if you listen to ngozi okay i got you brother you was right <laughs> <laughs> but um moving on i'm gonna get if you don't have any questions i'm gonna go right into the uh the similarities between the orishas and the natural rules uh deity by deity yeah go ahead brother not right now. Okay. All right. The first two deities I'm going to talk about is Oran Mila and Tahuti in Kemet. Oran Mila belonging to Ifa, Tahuti belonging to Kemet. Uh, the similarity between the two is both are the deities of divine knowledge. Oran Mila has the divine knowledge coming from Aludamare. Tahuti has divine knowledge coming from Ra or uh, any of the other creator deities. They both seem to be the only two deities that can go to these deities directly. If you remember the story of uh, the 365 days in which uh, I believe it was Geb and uh, Newt that needed to the five extra days to reproduce. So Tahuti went straight to Ra and bet him in a game in which he won and got the five days. Well, to uh, Oran Miller can go straight directly to Oludamare and he can ask him questions and he can uh, suggest things. So he has that power as well. So these two deities are very similar. Uh, they are also both attendants in the act of cre uh, creation. If you uh, recall, Tahuti was there during the creation when Ra was creating uh, man. And so was Oren Miller. He was right by Aludamari's side when he was creating man and the earth and everything uh, in between. Um, Oren Miller also, he has another factor to him. He has kind of a Heru factor because he is a he is classified as a savior. He's classified as a like one coming of being and one that has been foretold about. And we see that with Heru because as we know, Heru was foretold about and he came into being. Uh, Ora Miller also said that he will bring heaven down to earth and it will bring earth up to heaven. And that is the concept in Kemet as above, so below. They still, they have that concept in the Ifa tradition as well. So. You're starting to uh, get that picture of the way these two cultures were so similar in a lot of ways. Uh, moving on, we have Ishu and Maat. We all know Maat, truth, justice, righteousness, balance. Ishu is known as the trickster of the uh, Ifa tradition, but he's he's guided by Aludamare and he's responsible for the punishment. But the thing about Ishu that makes him align with Ma'at is he has the key, one of the keenest sense of justice among the Orishas. So he's responsible for basically, you know, righting the wrongs, wronging the rights and handing out punishments. And he basically balances the scales. This might sound familiar. <laughs> we know the scales of Ma'at in which uh, in the Amduat you have to put your heart on. 
and the scales either tip for the feather or tip for the heart. And that determines whether you go into the afterlife or if Amr eats your heart. So we see these two similarities between these two. Uh, and again, nothing can go forward without issue and nothing can go forward without my eye. same principle um, in two different cultures. Moving on, we have uh, Ogun and Heru. We know Heru as the uh, son of Asar and a warrior, Necheru. He goes to war against Set. Uh, Ogun is also a warrior um, deity. In fact, he is the deity of war in Ifa. And it is said that uh, he carries some machete like weapons. And if Ogun has a problem with you, you really have a problem in the Ifa tradition. But Heru and Ogun both have that warrior spirit, both have that passion, both will challenge anybody. There's a story uh, where Shango actually steals Ogun's wife and Ogun is very unhappy and he goes to challenge him. Now, Shango and Ogun are brothers in the Ifa tradition. So it's kind of similar to when Heru and Set, although they were related, but they weren't brothers, but he challenged him in the Kemeti tradition as well. So two warrior deities that were both not afraid to challenge family members. Uh, the next two is Obatala and Asar. First of all, they're both draped in white all the time. Whenever you see Obatala, he's draped in white. Whenever you see Asar, he's draped in white all the time. Obatala goes to heaven because he has turned his back. He came to earth and turned his back on man. He said, I don't like what's going on down here. I'm going to the afterlife. And we know when Asar gets resurrected, although he's not fully resurrected, he goes to the underworld, the afterlife. So they both go to the afterlife uh, in their separate stories, but it's still similar. Uh, Asar is known as sometime is king of the kings, king of the Nisuts. Um, Obatala is king of the Orishas. So same titles, just different language and different culture. And they're both known for judgment. We see the depiction in the papyrus of an eye when Asar is on the throne in judgment, judging uh, people that have uh, life has ceased to exist, particularly Anai. And when I was talking about earlier with the scales of my aunt, at the end of that scene is Asar on his throne. Obatala is like the first gate that you get to in the uh, afterlife of Ifa. Uh, Asar and Oso Nien. You also see similarities between these deities because, and it tells a story of the reverence for uh, agriculture that they had in both of these traditions. Uh, Asar is known as the Necheru of agriculture. And if you, when you go to the, uh, I forget what city, I want to say it's Waset. But when I went to Waset with Ashra Kwesi, they were handing out these sheaves of uh, wheat and they were handing it out to us. And we were like, why are you giving us wheat? Well, it's basically because He's the deity or the natural rule of agriculture. So agriculture is very important in the Kemet tradition. And it's, it's equally in the Ifa tradition because Oso Nien is also the Orisha of ag agriculture and farming and plants. So we see agriculture playing a big part in these two cultures. And they it was so important that they had to the name deities after them. Now, this is the most popular of the Orishas coming up. Everybody knows this guy. Everybody wants to get a reading and be this guy. And this guy is Shango. <laughs> Shango is very popular because of his uh, double acts and his spirit and his passion and, and uh, his temper, his ferocity. Everybody wants to be him when they get a reading. In fact, if you go on Facebook and type in Shango, you're going to get a hundred people just pop up because everybody wants to be Shango. So everybody wants to be Shango in the, in the uh, Ifa tradition. Everybody wants to be Heru in the, uh, <laughs> in the Kemet tradition. But the funny thing is the, the Orisha that Shango most matches is set. And the reason why I say that is because they both have violent tempers. 
They both have a uh, ferocity, uh, passion, war, and they match up uh, a lot more than uh, any other Neturu matches to Shango. That ferocious temper of violent energy. They're of the warrior class, that all out rage. Set was, Set was filled with rage when he found out that baby Heru was going to take the throne before him. So, you know, of course, he killed Asar, cut him up into pieces, scattered his pieces everywhere, and then fought Heru for the throne. So we see that ferocious temper in both of these uh, deities. Shango also has another element to him, and that is of Amen, because sometimes Shango is represented by Ram. And if you go to the temple of Ipidasut, on both sides, when you walk out of the temple and go straight out, you'll see rams on each side. Uh, and that is to represent Amun because he's represented by the ram sometimes. The next two uh, are Yemaya and Mut. Uh, Yemaya is basically the goddess of the waters and the ocean. She's also, if you get her in your uh, div divination, She's the one who keeps you out of trouble. I have her in my divination. She's my mother, Arisha. So she keeps me out of trouble and, you know, gives you that little instinct feeling and everything like that. And that's where, uh, what her role is. And Mut, as we know, is the great mother. Just like Yemaya, I just explained, is that great mother that keeps you out of trouble. But also we can equate Yemaya to Noon. As we know, Noon was the primordial waters, you know, the one that creation came out of. Yemaya, same role. And you have the exact same verbiage in the creation stories. Aludamare goes into the primordial waters to create civilization, just like, uh, depending on the creation story that you read, Pata, Ra, Amen, Nebetesha they go into the primordial waters to create civilization. So it's the same principle, but uh, two deities here that match up with her. Uh, the next two that we have is Oya and Ampu, or what some people call Anubis. Uh, Oya is a uh, wife to Shango. And Shango has a, a bit of a polygamy thing going on here because he has three wives. He has Oshun, Oya, and I can't remember his third wife's name, but uh, he keeps them all in succession. <laughs> but uh, Oya becomes enraged when she finds out that Shango is going to another woman when he is courting Oshun. So she steals part of his power. And uh, part of Shango's power is thunder and lightning. And she steals the lightning portion of his power. So now she's a dominant force. She's a dominant force just like Anubis is a dominant force. You know, the jackal head, he strikes fear in people's heart when people see him. And the thing about these two deities that match them up perfectly is Oya is described as the mother of nine, which is just a title, not that she has nine children. But she's described as the mother of nine who looks after the dead. The same way Anpu or Anubis is in charge of the embalmment and the looking after the dead souls as they go back to the Amduat. So same principle here, just two different deities. The only di real difference between these two is Oya happens to be a woman and Anpu, I'm guessing, is a guy. <laughs> i never seen him depicting as a uh, woman, so I'm going to guess Anpu or Anubis is a guy. Brother, um... Brother Black Panther, I want to ask a question. Go ahead. Um, I, I see we got a brother live that answered this and that has a question. I want to let the audience know, just submit your question. Mm -hmm. uh, similar to the brother here, his name is The Student. Um, we're we're going to ask you a question, but I don't want to cut the brother Black Panther's wisdom. So just submit your questions, and as we get them, I'll field them to the brother or myself. So just continue to submit your questions, everybody. Okay, go ahead, brother. Okay. Uh, the last one we have is a combination of a, a couple of different deities, but I'm going to uh, show why I did it that way. Aludamare, which is the supreme in the uh, Ifa, and Nebatesher, Ra, Amen, or Ptah. And the reason why I did that is because uh, in many creation stories, you know, uh, Ra talks about I was one and then I was three and, and same thing with Pata. Well, as we know, Nebetesher is a is basically the supreme deity in Kemet. 
Ra, Pata, and Amun are different manifestations of him. It's the same thing with Aludamare. He is the supreme deity, but later he manifests himself in ways of Alorun and Alofi. Alorun is in charge of heaven. Alofi is in charge of earth. And of course, he is in charge of uh, Aludamare is in charge of all of it. So we see the supreme deity structure, the almost trinity. Well, it is a trinity, actually, that we see with these two creation stories. So it's the same principle again, the uh, the all in all. And he manifests himself in different ways, just like the all in all in Kemet manifest himself in different ways. So. You will you will see this throughout the Ifa and Kemet um, structures, and they are very similar. And uh, there's actually a pyramid in Nigeria that I don't know the name of at the time, but I'm going to uh, get it before this broadcast is over. But it actually looks exactly like the step pyramid in Sakura, if you ever see a picture of it. And I'm going to get the name. It's in my phone. I'm going to get it. But uh, that's just a testament to how similar these uh, people were and how Niger Congo or Niger uh, sub-Saharan Africans did play a huge role in Kemet. I mean... This is this is proof positive that there are so many similarities, even down to the structures. So as much as we study Kemet, we got to study these sub-Saharan African nations as well, because it will help you understand Kemet better from the language to the structures to the uh, spiritual systems. And this is just one spiritual system that is a. Uh, like Kemet, there are a lot uh, Odiani, Lao, Fon, Dehodeme. All these spiritual systems, you will find bits and pieces of Kemet that are exactly the same in these spiritual systems. All right, um, I'll, I'll field you this question. Uh, this okay. question is from the student. Mm -hmm. um, and he asks, where can we find your sources about tonight's teaching? Okay. Uh, Maybe the brother came in a little uh, later. There's two books. One, The Way of the Orisha by Philip John Niemark. And you know what? I'm just going to turn my camera on so you can see one of the books. This is one of the books right here, The Way of the Orisha. And uh, I don't have the other book with me, but it's, uh, what is it called? Something about the path to Orisha. You can get it in uh, almost any other uh, African bookstore. It has a uh, orange background with green letters, and that's another good book to pick up for uh, Orishas. And um, other than those two books, I don't know a lot of sources outside of those two books. Um, fortunately, I am a part of the Ifa family. I have received my original reading to determine my head or Ori Orisha. I am a uh, Omo Ogun, or as they would say, a child of Ogun. Um, I'm going through my divination to become an Ogun priest later this year. Um, I have to travel to Nigeria to do it. So I'm going to get a lot of footage for you guys in Yoruba land, and it's going to be a good time. So hope I answered the brother's question. Thank you much, sir. So I hope Brother, uh, the student, I hope we answered your question as best that we could. Um, and I'm, I'm going to add a question as well. Okay. Um, the parallels of the Nintido and the Orishi, um, why do you think the parallels are so close, in your opinion? Uh, and, I, and me and Ngozi have had uh, talks about this all the time. We have to stop looking at Kim and like these Africans just popped up out of nowhere. And, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Kemet just rose out the ground. I mean, Kemet is a makeup of different African groups. And the proof of that is in their language. Uh, we find their language consonant with uh, Wolof, Proto-Bantu, and other African languages. And it's actually through those languages that early translators started to decode the Medu Neche. And we're talking about, you know, after uh, Chapoleon. But they started to critique people that were 
deciphering the metal nature based on the consonants in other African languages. I was talking to brother uh, Sanjeti and he was telling me about a word in Kenya, uh, uh, Hepe. Uh, Hepe and Hotep are consonants to one another, but they both mean the same thing. A peace offering, an uh, offering of something or peace. So this is the way that they went about to decipher the metal nature to make sure that it was accurate, excuse me, was through other sub-Saharan African languages. So I definitely think these people in this area were once in Kemet. And depending on when they were flushed out, they probably settled in Nigeria. And that's why you see a, a continuation of the tr tradition today. Either that or the tradition was before Kemet. And they influenced Kemet and then they went back to their uh, or went or settled in Nigeria after they were flushed out. So those are two hypotheses that I have. OK, um, the student chimes in again. He says, finding soul on the path of Orisha, a West African spiritual tradition by uh, Tobe Melora Correa. Is that the right book? Yes, there that is it. it. Yeah, student, there you found it. That, that is, is it. the right book, right? So, so with these with these similarities, um, hold on a second here. Okay, with these um, with these similarities, and we spoke about this also in the last show, a couple shows ago, when we were talking about Sub-Saharan <clears throat> Africa, Western Africa, being so influential to a lot of these monolithic um, civilizations. They actually populated these civilizations. What what about these titles? And I'm gonna give you a, an example. You got for people who don't know, you have the Orisha, which is a divination system. What is what, how was the Orisha compared to Vodun and Santeria and Ifa and those other divination systems? Are they one and the same? The Yoruban culture are they all one and the same? Well, first of all, um, Ifa is the tradition of the Yoruba people. So mm -hmm. that is their spiritual system. You will find other spiritual systems in uh, Nigeria, like uh, Odiani. That's a, a spiritual system of the Igbo people. Um, to go over titles, uh, Vodun, Santeria. Basically, first of all, let me cover Santeria. Santeria is basically Ifa and Catholicism combined. Okay. That's all Santeria a lot of is. Don't, a lot of people don't know that. Thank you, brother. They don't know that because all they did was attach different patron saints to the Ifa Orishas. So you'll see uh, like Ogun and St. Michael together. Right. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just something that that's a classic tactic of Christianity. They try to, uh, if they can't true. wipe you out completely, Yes. If they can't, you know, assimilate you into their culture, well, they try to latch on to your culture. So they didn't like the whole total E5 thing. So they were, okay, well, let's just attach these white guys <laughs> to your African spirits and everybody will be happy, okay? Right. And, you know, <laughs> that's how it happens. And I, and I know brothers in Santeria, uh, but the original is not Santeria. Um, in regards to Vodun, you'll see some of the same symbols, signs, and deities in Vodun that you have in Ifa. I mean, you Ogun's in Ifa, uh, is in a uh, Vodun. Shango is in Vodun. Oya is in Vodun. So I look at Ifa as just as an extension of Vodun because not only the rituals, the uh, Orishas. And the uh, tools, almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Do you agree that the? Go ahead, go ahead, brother. Do you agree that um, logistically, the um, Orisha system and the Netheru system, originally because you know we, we talk about the Metuneta, has become quite popular today. I've always felt, and I'm almost inclined to agree with Seti in some aspects. <laughs> But uh -oh. I love the way Seti break it down. You know you got to do your Seti impression. 
when he doing when, when, he, <laughs> when he when he's talking about the Medunetta. <laughs> but I tend to believe in my research that the Medunetta was originally a divination system that were really allocated to priests. Mm. And I want your opinion on that and also trying to correlate the divination system to um, a different form of spirituality because a lot of religious folk try to equivocate that the um, the Arisha and Netaru system was one and the same with the religions, particularly the three Abrahamic religions of today. And it's not, but I want you to expound on that. The matter of nature is, is so complex uh, because it's, you know, it's without vows. Um, so the reconstruction is, is difficult. And, and I was there live when Seti was talking about, you know, no one really knows uh, the Meta Nature uh, and you're taking it from white Egyptologists and so on and so forth. Shouts out to the general uh, Saras who said, you know, that's my brother, whether I disagree with him scholarly or not. Right. But uh, I disagree because uh, we find these same words, like I was saying earlier with the with the Hepa, uh, we find that consonant with the words in Kemet meaning the same things. So we don't need white Egyptologists, especially now on the squad with my brother Sanjeti and Wu Jawu, who are qualified linguists. We don't need the white boy to, in, to interpret these words. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually critique them. Jonathan Owens can uh, send you an email that he sent to a, a Egyptologist and basically smashed him on his translations. And not only did he smash him, but the Egyptologists agreed with him. <laughs> and that's what we do here because uh, everything that you read in uh, the Book of the Dead by Wallace A. Budge isn't correct. Everything that you read in the, the Book of the Dead by Faulkner isn't correct. So we critique those things and we, uh, we break them down to where we look for errors. And, that mm -hmm. was, and that's what we've done. So I would disagree with uh, Seti saying that nobody can translate the meta nature. But I will speak on the point of, excuse me, the priests were quoted as saying that there was an exoteric meaning of the meta nature and an esoteric meaning of the meta nature reserved for the Nisut Biti or the king. So although we can break down the words, we may not know exactly what it meant to the royal family or the nobles, the Karihel priests, and then the suits, because that was reserved for royalty. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we'll ever find out <laughs> the true spiritual meaning behind these words that we're reading. And I definitely think that the, the Medu Netra was like a rites of passage because the common person in Kemet and Medu Netra were far from each other. Not only that, when you talk about Medu Netra, you got to be talking about the hieratic script. You got to be talking about demotic. So these are other languages. I mean, not other languages. These are other forms of how they wrote the Medu Netra that was uh, different from the actual ideograms. So the common person for my studies didn't know how to do this. So mm -hmm. definitely reserved for the royalty. So that is definitely, I would definitely agree with you on that point that, uh, it was a divination or a initiation with the meta nature and not just words on paper. Okay. Got another question. Let's see. Um, again, from the student, I noticed commissions were fire worshipers with the mystery system that they believe that the universe, I guess that's his spin on universe that the universe was created by fire autumn. And hmm. how was it actually created by Adam? Hmm. Um, when you say fire worshipers, that's a very uh, misleading term because uh, the people, uh, first of all, I want to get you out of the uh, habit of saying Kemites or uh, Kemetians. That's not uh, historically accurate. If you're going to say Egyptian people, you're going to say uh, Kemeti. Um, they also refer to themselves as Nai Kemets. And um, 
you know, we need to get into the practice of saying the uh, words of our ancestors. So the Kimiti, uh, worshipers, I would not say so, but they did revere the elements. You can uh, look at the Kemet culture and basically look at it as panty, uh, pantheism, right. which everything has a spirit. And uh, right. you can look this term up, pantheism, and uh, basically having respect for everything in nature. They were huge on nature. Every, they observed nature. That's how they got the zoo tights for all of their naturus was looking at nature. They observed the Ebus bird. They observed, observed the dung beetle. They observed the falcon. They observed the uh, wild African uh, dog that was in the desert. They observed all these things and attached them to divine spirits. And that's how they uh, got their naturus. Now, Atom, Atom is just an extension of Ra. So uh, <laughs> Atom, uh, obviously he comes later um, in the uh, creation stories, but I understand what you're saying because from looking at Kemet literally, you'll say, oh, they're worshiping fire. And that's why they have Atom here and he's the sun and fire and everything. But it's actually, it's everything in Kemet is, is a metaphor. Everything's a metaphor. Uh, Ra is the physical, Pata is the uh, metaphysical or subatomic energy, and so on and so forth. Everything has a divine law and a divine spirit. So when you look at the Kemeti or the Remetch, which is the people of Kemet, don't look at it literally. Look at the culture and look at what they're trying to tell you. Because if you try to look at Kemet literally, you probably miss the point. And I missed the point for years until I actually started reading the language. And then I was like, oh, I, I would have never came across this. So that would be my advice to the young brother. Yes, sir. Good advice it is. Uh, brother Student, I see you asked a question on the spelling. That is correct uh, with the committee, K-E-M-E-T-Y. It is variances, mm -hmm. but you, you can get by with that. Um, I would suggest... Mm -hmm that you reach out to the brother Wujawu. Yes, sir. And get his book and start his course. I believe his course is $60. It's a, I think it's a six or 12 week course. And um, is it 12 weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in it right now. <laughs> so I think that that would benefit <laughs> you a great deal. Because we haven't started yet. We had our first meeting. So you, you jump on in. It's a, uh, Metal net, uh, dot com, M D W N T R dot com. And you can sign up, get the book, and start learning with us. We're trying to reconstruct the language, uh, not by using the Semitic or the uh, Hamito Semitic, which they try to reconstruct Metal Nature from. We're trying to construct it from the African languages, which is what they should have been doing the entire time. So right. that's what we're going to be doing. So you'll be going into trilaterals, bi bilaterals, the traditional the terminatives, the whole shebang bang. Yeah, you'll be doing the seven form metonetta, which is a yeah. little bit different. Okay, you'll be understanding the Rick Diamond going into the 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 um the foundational language. So it's very powerful. Also, when you use words like worship, uh student, you gotta realize certain words are byproducts of social and political um constructs. So the the um, committee were not religious in that sense. Now the definition of religious can be applied to a lot of things. You can religiously study something. You know what I'm saying? But we're speaking on the terms of organized uh, prostration or prayer. It was a natural flowing um, symbionts with nature, where it was a respect for the need of one another, you for nature and nature for you. So when they dealt with fire, fire was a family member. Fire was kindred, fire was an extension. So it wasn't like, oh mighty fire, you have power over me. No, fire, you are an extension of me and, and you and I am an extension of you and we utilize each other within this universe. So it's a higher level of thought. And that's why we get, you know, Kemet is so widely disrespected because it's misunderstood mm -hmm. as to how the um, 
the psychological level. And that's why you need a controlled, isolated environment when learning this culture. This is not something you could just pick up a book and grasp it. There's levels to it. You literally got to, one, pick up a book, study it. Two, you got to go there. Three, you got to deal with the indigenous people there. You got to at least get that far. And then you have to know that it was certain, it was certain religious aspects in, in, as far as attacks that were made on Kimmin as well. Um, we got another question from the same brother. Okay. Uh, let's see. Before you go into that question, I want to I want to touch on something real quick. Uh, I typed this up at the top: uh, religious persecution, because mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Ben used to say, "Who is going to relieve Kemet from religious persecution?" And one of the things uh, that people have to understand is, like you said, the the definition today we have of religion can cover a lot of things. But if you go into the old religions, there's two uh, sources: there's old English and old French. And they both mean to tie down or to bind. What are they tying down and what are they binding? They're basically tying down and binding you to a book or a set of beliefs or a, or a text. And that is why I say that Africa had no religion because you're not going to find a book indigenously that they were tied and binded to. Because we were more oral tradition, mouth to ear. Mm -hmm. There was no book that you will, you, you got to get in this book. And if you don't get in this book, you're going to hell. Like we didn't have any, we didn't have a structure like that. There are many books in Kemet from the, the book of life, the book of uh, Ra, the trample of Pep, the book of the dead or the uh, Perhem Eru. I mean, so many books when you go to the Valley of the Kings that nobody talks about. I mean, uh, what's the book that, Patahotep uh, teachings uh, or instructions. The teachings of Patahotep. Patahotep. Oldest book in the world. Nobody Oldest talks. book in the world. <laughs> yeah, and no one talks about that book. So, I mean, you got it's the book a of lot. Gates. Book of Gates. Very, very the Book of Gates. Um, Nobody talks about it. No one talks about these books, but you don't see anyone being punished for not uh implementing these books beliefs into their uh different rulerships by the suit you don't see uh you know i cannot being there's no temple talking about him going to a lake of fire or uh <laughs> being punished by Amun or and if anybody should have been punished by Amun, it should have been i cannot but there's no inscriptions of that <laughs> at right. any temple you know so it wasn't a religion <laughs> Uh, structure in West, like the Western civilization that we have today. Um, this brother here has a pretty good question here. Okay. Uh, he says, Ashe, brother, do you know Ashe. anything about Greek language? I've heard Greeks called Kemeti, Hoi Agriptoi, black people. This is a good question. Mm. Uh, this is a question that a I wish. With black people and black land. And I know you're going to expound on that. Go ahead. Ah, the black land. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> one thing when you're looking at Kemet, uh, the word Kemet, um, obviously K&M means uh, black. Uh, but the T and the uh, determinative at the end is what's throwing a lot of people off and which mm -hmm. has sparked many debates because mm -hmm. people say it means black land, but land is ta. That's right. Land of the bow. Ta Marae, beloved land. Ta Neta, land of the divine. So if there's no ta at the end, if it was the black land, it would be Kemata. But it's not Kemata. So it can't really mean the black land without that ta principle in it. Now, if you look at that determinative, many people have speculated about what that circle with that X is. And uh, Grandmaster Infudishi has said that that is actually a community and that it means black community. Now, I uh, cross referenced that with Wujawu to see, you know, what he thought, felt about it. He believes that, you know, black community is fine, but not black community in the uh, respect of a black people in the community, more of the soil the uh the soot and the natural resources that being black 
And that was the, the premise for naming the, uh, the land Kemet. And that was a conversation I had with him uh, a couple of days ago. So be careful with that black land stuff. You know, it's cool to say, and you know, we all know that the people, uh, the Remetch, were black Africans. We have the DNA, we have the uh, pictures, we have the bones. I mean, they got 13 of them in the Cairo Museum that they charge you 100 Egyptian pounds to go back there and see that I was very upset about, but they have them back there. So there's no debate on whether uh, they were black Africans. We don't have to, you know, have a title of a place that means, you know, that has our stamp on it. We already know what it, what it, uh, and, and what about his reference to Hoya Giptoy as far as I black would actually have to ask Sanjeti or Wujawa about that. I'm not real versed in Greek language. Um, sorry that I wouldn't, uh, Oh, we got we got the Ngozi coming in there, so maybe he can uh, expound on the Greek language and that particular word because uh, I'm not well versed in the Greek language. Yeah, um, well, with Hoy Egyptoi, you have to understand the Greeks' mentality. When you say black people, there's a misnomer if the Greeks have even got themselves established. When you read certain works like uh, Black Athena by Mark Bernal or Stolen Legacy, which is a uh, classic work, the Greeks never really had themselves an opportunity to become established to be a defining class of people. So when we look at the Greeks and we go into Phoenicia, which is highly African, influenced by the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, um, it wouldn't make sense for black people to go, look, there go some black people. <laughs> so you you got to kind of you got to kind of uh, do your research on that, and the jury is still out on that on that claim. Um, brother, uh, in, but I like to throw a question your way um, in regards to a classification, in regards to um, the term Hoya Giptoi, given by the Greeks. Uh, classifying black people of Kemet. Um, or, you know, they call the Kemeti Hoya Giptoi, black people. What is your opinion on that? The term uh, Kemet referring to black people. The term Kemet referring to black people? Or Kemeti, since we enlightened him on Kemeti, he's using Kemeti now and saying okay. that the Greeks' equivalent was Hoya Giptoi. Okay. meaning black people, as opposed to black land. Because there are two popular, you know, misnomers going around, black land and black people. Mm -hmm. But like you so eloquently explained it, ta refers to the land. Mm -hmm. So now when we start talking about people, that's a big difference. Because everybody was Africoid in that region. Mm -hmm. So what would be shocking to them to where they would have to name them according to their skin hue. You know, I, I, I actually, uh, I know where he's asking this, but Ngozi can better break down. Yeah, that's why I'm asking him. Yeah. Between, uh, you know, the Greeks, the Assyrians, and, and those brothers that was dark versus the Assyrians when they rose up. Ngozi, you there, brother? Yes, sir. Yep, right here, bro. Yeah, break that story down, brother. Break that story down for the people. Well, which one? The one where the, the two sets of Greeks. Oh, oh, you had the um, you had the Greeks or the Cretans or the Athenians who were who were half black who live in the southern parts of Greece or the southern part of what we know today as Greece, and you had the Macedonian or the um, Bulgarian type who came in and invaded and invaded like King Philip. And Alexander the Fag, who we know as Alexander the Great, they were really Bulgarian and, hum and Hungarian type who came in like the Bosnia type and established Macedon. But they pushed out the original Cretans or the Black Athena that was living in the southern Mediterranean first. Now those cats who was half black was just, they were half black. It was predominantly men that were intermingling with uh, the women in Crete for thousands of years. And then when you follow the phylogenetic tree 
of what those people have or the DNA that they have, you clearly see the E3BV or the EV12 subclass mutation branch of it in that part of the world. So yeah, you had, um, it depends on what type of Greek we You are muted, bro. Did, you, did he mute himself? Yeah, I think he did. <laughs> yeah, Come on, you gozy. Right, you might not even realize it. You on mute, bro. He can't realize it when we talking to him? <laughs> you are on mute. Anyway, uh, till Brother Ngozi gets it back together. So you can kind of see from that story uh, how the Macedonians rose up and, uh, and they took over Greece. And so the Black Athenians were drove out and then they made it with them. So, you know, it's, it, you get a different type of Greek after thousands of years. So now we see the, the uh, principle and the reason behind you have Greeks saying there are some black people. So that term may be uh, appropriate to the Kemeti or to the Remetch because of that instance in history. But without that context, you know, it seems weird. Like like Kansu said, why would black people say there are black people? But uh, people have the misconception of A, that Greeks have always been black and they were always were black. And then they have, it's another misconception that Greeks were always white and they always going to be white, and that's not true. There was an um, an instance that happened, like the brother Ngozi broke down with the Black Athenians. So, and they were half black. So we're talking about mulattoes here. And anytime you have mulattoes that mix with another group of uh, non-Africans, you're going to get even non-Africans. So now another race of people is going to rise, <laughs> and uh, they're not going to look like you at all. So. It's all yeah. genetics, and uh, with that backstory, now we understand why the the, the Greek word uh, that you mentioned earlier is in place. And yes, brother, you, yes, I, I realize you acknowledge you got it from the book Stolen Legacy. That's mm -hmm. why I mentioned it, along with uh, Hoya get the, along with Black Athena by Mark Bernal. Now, with Stolen Legacy, if you have the original published copy, which is really hard to find, he has notes for each chapter in the back of his book, which is the reason why GM James was murdered. Some of the notes that he wasn't, he wasn't supposed to publish. Yep, because yep. this was talking about a lot of the, the private investors that were investing in covering a lot of this up, that the Greeks were African, and that the whole Greek quote unquote people were a fabrication. So he alluded to that in his book, mm -hmm. but he didn't have the resources for that time. So Mark Bernal kind of added to the paradigm because of technology and he was able to do further research. So you would get the Hoya Giptoi coming from Georgia, but it may be limited ability to, to do certain types of research. This is what makes all of those great grandmasters so impressive because they laid the groundwork, the, the, the groundwork so that we're able to kind of take it to the next level. OK, so sometimes you're not going to get the end all be all from one of our grandmasters like um, George G.M. James, but you will get the foundry tools. Um, right. We have another question. Um, the question is, did the uh, committee believe in reincarnation? Hmm. Reincarnation. I haven't seen uh, much proof to reincarnation as opposed to a guy dying and then his spirit being resurrected through uh to go into another person's body no i haven't seen any uh resurrection in uh the kimity or the people of remetch culture maybe you can uh, expound on that a little more Kansu. Mm. Kansu. Okay. Well, Sorry, guess I, I, I had a little interference. I couldn't hear oh. you. Could you repeat that oh. again, bro? I was saying that I didn't see any uh, evidence to uh, suppose that the Remetch believe in reincarnation in the terms of a person dying and their spirit 
going into another person's body and uh, him becoming that. I have seen that uh, the Nasuts wanted the prior Nasuts names in their name because they believe that those names gave them power. And that's the only thing that I've seen in uh, Kemet that kind of looks like reincarnation. But no, I haven't seen any uh, reincarnation in uh, Kemet. No, the only, the only thing you will see, I agree with you too, brother. I haven't seen that. I've seen regeneration mm. um, in the form of um, Haru or Horus. I've seen regeneration but right. never have I seen reincarnation. Um, that's a bit uh, different. That's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So no, I haven't. I agree with you, brother. I haven't seen uh, that anywhere. So another question is um, that I'm asking is the introduction, the introduction of the saints that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what what caused that? What 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 created that issue? And has that given way to modern day religion? Uh, what caused it has that is the type of African spirituality. What was that last part? Um, change the backdrop of African spirituality. What caused it is the same old story that we see uh, over and over from a European invasion. It is them trying to conquer our people with religion. And it happens over and over. If you, uh, even uh, St. Patrick's Day, if you study the history of that and the fact that the Catholic priest tried to convert the people of there with the, uh, the three-leaf culvert to explain the Trinity and the people that they could not convert, there's a passage in their records that say, we drove the snakes out of Ireland. Many people believe that those people were actually the twa that they drove out. But uh, that's neither here nor there. The concept is if we can't assimilate you into our culture, we're going to try to get rid of you. And then when we can't get rid of you, we're just going to latch on to you and attach our system to your system. Another example would be the birth of Serapis Christos. Serapis Christos is a deity, and I don't know if people know this, but Asar is an element of Serapis Christos. And this, it was basically created so that the Romans and, and uh, the people of that area could go back and forth to Kemet and continue to learn things. So they couldn't conquer them at that time. But now oh, I'm going to place a deity in place that you can kind of identify with so we can continue to learn from you. <laughs> and it's the same tactic they've been doing over and over, and, and it has very adverse consequences on African spirituality because new systems are born out of these latch-on periods like Santeria, and now you have people that come around that don't even know that Santeria is a originally spawn from an African spiritual system. They have no idea. I've met plenty of Spanish people that are into Santeria and uh, they see my tattoo because I, I have a tattoo of the uh, of the pattern of Ogun and they go, why do you have that tattoo? Are you into Santeria? And I go, no. And they're like, well, you shouldn't have that. I was like, well, Ogun is originally in my spiritual system. And they shake their heads like I, they didn't know that. And I have to show them all of these things. And they have no idea that it came from an Africa, African cosmology spiritual system and not a Spanish Catholic system, system that they've been taught. So it has a very adverse effect on uh, African spirituality. And uh, it's just a lesson for the future generations. Mm -hmm. If they were ever to try to latch on to our spiritual systems again, we uh, we that's that's an act of war for me because uh exactly. haiti felt the same way what, what keeps us or one of the most powerful weapons against white supremacy is our culture us simply practicing our culture that bothers white supremacy because they want to assimilate you into their culture and by our us practicing our culture 
we don't fall into their traps. So this is why they continue to try to latch on to our cultures, not only to learn, but to, in time, create off of our culture. They've done it over and over. So we have to take that as an act of war. And we have to stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and defend our culture at all costs. Mm -hmm. No question. That's very important, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you understand that, that our cultures was caused an issue. If you go back into history and you study world history, most religions are implemented through the um, conquering of a people. Once those people are conquered, then they're assimilated into a different culture. Mm -hmm. And with that culture comes a different economic structure, comes a different value system, comes a different religious, i.e. spiritual system. And that takes your foundation away from you. So you don't have a barometer of where you came from so that you know where to go. So all you can do is just follow the status quo, not knowing who you are and what your foundation is. And that's very important. And that's what separates us to this day because we don't have an understanding of our foundation. Um, brother, a uh, student also, he followed up saying as far as uh, reincarnation, he mean living past lives, having multiple lives with the same soul. Um, once again, brother, and I, I'm sure brother Black Panther digressed, I, I've never, I've never seen that aspect, um, especially with a I've seen one. Same soul. I've you, seen one. Okay, go ahead, brother. Expound on. Uh, and I actually sent this name to brother Sanjetti a few days ago. I believe his name is a, uh, uh, not Amsu. It was something. It translated to brother, mother. So it was a Mutsin, Mutsinet. And he was a uh, master builder in the consort of Hatshepsut uh, when Hatshepsut's husband died. And he was said to be Imhotep reborn. Mm. So that is the only time that I have seen uh, that happening. And I believe the son of Hapu, uh, uh, Amenhotep, the son of Hapu, may have that title, Imhotep Reborn as well, but um, they've only mentioned it. Like, this person is so good that he must be this person reborn. But uh, none of the spiritual aspect that you see of today of people claiming of past lives or um, this is this person from a different life or I haven't seen anything like that, but I have seen people being so skilled at what they do that they compare them to people. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. Um, well, yeah, that, that would definitely kind of uh, substantiate some form of reincarnation if you look at it in that aspect. So, student, hopefully we were we able to answer the best that we could. You know, um, hopefully we were able to do that. So in, in, in this divination system, how if one wanted to get involved, what would they need to do? If they were interested and wanted to become or learn more about this divination system, what would you suggest? Okay. If you're already... Uh active in your community and you know uh, Pan-Africans and people that stand up for black people, I would start asking your friends uh, who, uh, excuse me, who is into Ifa, And uh, through them, you can find what's called a Baba Lao, which is the priest who can uh, give you a reading. Through this reading, you will determine your Ori Orisha or head Orisha, the one that governs you, the one that you're most like. He'll also give you your mother Orisha and your father Orisha. Um, so you'll ha you'll get the whole, you know, the trinity of the Orishas that uh, you're attached to. Um, if you're not active in the community yet, I would say the internet is always a great tool. Try to find a, a Ifa temple uh, in your area. Do some research on that temple talk to people before you go because 
just like anything, brothers and sisters, they're scam artists. Uh, things to look for when you go to a Baba Lau's house, if you do not see a circular yellow tray and a, uh, and a divination tool, they kind of, you know what, hold on for a second. I'm gonna get uh, something to show the people. Hold on, I'll be right back. So yeah, so that is very because house in Northern America that are charging you an arm and a leg. Remember, you gotta understand that this spiritual system has been corrupted as well. And it's been treated like a storefront church, just like any other system. So you have to be adept and all right. And uh before I get going, I want to shout out my brother uh, Ivan Irvy uh, in the Raising Awareness group out there in Philly. If y'all don't uh, know him, check him out on Facebook, Raising Awareness group. Brothers do good work, good scholarship, and uh, sound research. So I just want to shout out my brother. Uh, this is the tool that I'm telling you about that you need to look for. It's a divination tool. This is Elegba, or the opener of the way. And... Uh, in Ifa tradition, he would be equivalent to the uh, Wepwawet in Keme, the opener of the way. So they use this to draw the designs on that circular uh, yellow palette that I was telling you about. It has like a little bit of sand on it. And they, they use it to draw the designs to get your uh, head Orisha, mother Orisha, father Orisha. So if you don't see these type of tools in uh, the house, I wouldn't mess with it. Uh, usually, Baba Lau's house will have many uh, statues of uh, Orishas in his house. So, um, you know, be inquisitive. Uh, do your research because I've heard of brothers getting charged ridiculous amounts of money for readings. Uh, I would say, brothers, no more than $50 should be charged. So, uh, Remember that if a brother come at you like, yeah, I want to do your uh, Orisha reading for three hundred dollars. Like, nah, brother. Way <laughs> too. <laughs> you know, learn how to spot the fakes, man. Because you know, just like anything from Africa, people are looking to take advantage of it and make it their own. And uh, you know, in, in actuality, the president of this book has actually formed an Ifa uh, foundation. And he is the president. And that's the reason why I recommended the other book as well, because I know the other book, uh, I believe, is written by a brother. But this guy is not a brother, but he formed a foundation off of our spiritual system because he went to Nigeria and they taught him the spiritual system. So we got to stop teaching. <laughs> It's the same thing over and over, you know. We become as missionaries, we teach them their way, our ways, and then they come with a change. We gotta stop teaching. So they taught him, and you know, I've been over this book with my Bible Lao, so I can know that the information is accurate. But they taught him, you know, the way of the Orisha. He wrote a book, started a foundation, and now he's getting paid off our spiritual system. So brothers and sisters don't want to go in there and see a, a cracker of Baba Lao. They want to see a brother look like me, you know. They, <laughs> they want to see a brother. <laughs> with some melanin, but you know, we're like with everything, they're gonna try to take advantage. So be careful, uh, you know, what temple you decide on. And uh, you know, if you, if you need help with that, uh, people can reach out to me, uh, put my name in the, in the chat here, so you can find me on Facebook and I'll do research, ask my Bob Lau uh if he's legit because one thing i've learned is a tight-knit community especially in the united states because there's not that many legit uh baba Lows out there and they all know each other like <laughs> it's crazy uh there's a whole community in south carolina uh the uh, oyo tundi community in south carolina i believe it's in sumner south carolina so if you're in south carolina you're in the prime place to go get your reading because they have set up uh, the traditions of Ifa there. Uh, that's a great place to start. Uh, wow, okay. That, now that's some powerful information. Uh, that's really good to know. So 
as far as um when when are your next so when are your next ceremonies um uh, taking place bro could you repeat that again i am trying to go later this year probably around um i'm going to kemet and again in july going back to kemet after that i'm going to be looking towards uh going to nigeria so i would say sometime uh maybe september october i'm going to be going to uh nigeria for my divination uh which i'm going to be made into an ogun priest and uh officially bind my spirit so uh it's a very um spiritual practice there you know now that i think about it, there's a pbs documentary on ifa which is excellent uh, if you type in pbs and ifa it should come right up or pbs and yoruba it should come right up it's probably about an hour it's a great documentary they go to nigeria it's two young ladies who are being made into ocean priestess they go during the ocean festival it's a great tool to uh to see the culture see the uh the language and the brother actually tried to get in to get in there to film the uh the divination they kicked him out he's like nah you can't <laughs> you can't film this brother <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, you know uh that's definitely something that you should watch and you would gain a great understanding of uh the culture and uh, why they do certain things. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's that's cool. Well, it looks like you know we we ran. Um, I, I know that. I believe that were, those were the deities that you wanted to cover. Mm -hmm. Those those that were correlated. Um, and I hope everybody understands how direct it is. Sometimes you know. Um, If you don't really understand the foundation of the of their system, but um, it is literally um, hand for hand uh, the same system. You know, mm -hmm. once you do your study and your research, it's real simple to see those similarities. Oh so, yeah. Um, do you have um, before we close out, man? Do you have any statements or anything you want to leave with the people, man? Uh, one thing I know people that look into indigenous African uh, spiritual system, they get spooked by one thing. And this is how westernized our minds are because we get spooked by this. And many traditional spiritual systems, the word sacrifice comes up. And brothers start getting uneasy and they start sitting up straight and they get nervous. They start sweating. And because we're not introduced to this from children like they are. Um, I will explain it to people this way. When you go to a grocery store and you pick up that pack of meat that's been slaughtered, that meat hasn't been prayed over. That meat, didn't, they didn't give that animal the reverence and respect that it deserved. They didn't thank the animal for its spirit. They just slaughtered it and they put it on a slab to uh, logistically ship it to a group. In the Ifa tradition, the Lao tradition, the Dahodami tradition, the Odiana tradition, the bodies of these animals are prayed for. They thank the animals for their spirit, and only the Baba Lao can make these uh, sacrifices to the divine spirits. So it's not going to be something you're going to be doing. You're not going to be up there, you know, hacking nothing, you know. It's a deeply spiritual connection. And going back to earlier, the pantheism, thanking that spirit because it, it is an extension of us. Thanking it for that energy, thanking it for that life. So you're not going to be uh, drinking blood or whatever this crazy stuff I see on uh, <laughs> the computer. Uh, I mean, people just got it twisted. And uh, let me also talk about voodoo dolls. There's no such <laughs> no such thing as a voodoo doll to inflict any type of harm on an individual. Now, you do have people that try to use this practice for uh, 
less than uh, meritable uh, practice. But those people usually don't know what they're doing and are going to inflict some harm on them. If you try, yeah. let me say that, don't try this stuff at home. Don't be trying to build no altars or start chanting and stuff like that. You don't know what you're doing because this is serious. This is serious stuff. And if you don't know what you're doing, some adverse reactions uh, can happen. So uh, exactly. just keep that in mind. And most of the people that say they want to uh, practice voodoo or whatever to try to get somebody, they end up getting themselves. So that energy they, is real. What's going on, brother? Yes, that energy is real. And it's and it's just as real as the uh, divine spirits in Kemet with their, uh, how they observe it's nature. It's not really anything evil, though, because people try to make it out to be something wrong. It's just like, okay, it's like a force that, that, that is, is it can be used for good or it can be used to your advantage. It's not just evil like people try to say. Correct. And that is the westernized uh, thinking that they bestowed on people. And here's the trick. They trick you that it's evil, but then you go into these shrines of these of these uh, fraternities and they're practicing something very similar. So they've tricked the African mind to think, oh, don't do that because this is against this and this is against this book and you shouldn't be doing that when your ancestors did it indigenously and then they go behind your back and practice the same stuff that you're doing. I mean, go to the the, the Catholicism's uh, back rooms where they just can't can't lit. I have one quick question uh, regarding ahead. that. Dealing with religious syncretism, we know that their religion within Catholicism, the Catholics had a similar system of ancestor veneration, although I don't know whether it was good or bad. I'm, I don't know, but I, I know we, <clears throat> the people in Haiti who have made their uh, faith, their national religion there, we got to big them up for that. They actually had Santeria or modern voodoo mixed within, and they had uh, Catholic saints uh, synced, synced with their deities. So, uh, yeah, with that whole thing. Yeah, I was going over that earlier uh, before you joined, brother. Uh, the Catholic saint attached to the Eve, uh, attached to the Vodun is called Santeria, and uh, that is a uh, product of invasion and not being able to wipe a people totally out. So uh, they latched on to their spiritual system, and I was explaining earlier that we shouldn't let Europeans latch on to our spiritual system because that's an act of war. Mm. Okay, I'm glad I got on the tail end at least, you know, just as you know, hear what y'all was saying. I'm gonna watch the video when y'all put it up. I say, I say. And and there and you will also find different uh Vodun practices on the island in Jamaica as well. Uh they have different names, but again, the same principle. In fact, the uh deity that uh Desaline and uh, Descartes and Toussaint that they prayed to before they went into battle into with Napoleon was Ogun. And uh, I actually have that prayer. Yes, I have it right here. It says, I humbly stand before Ogun as I prepare for battle. I call upon you to aid me in this time of war. My enemies have transgressed. They have violated every sacred principle. They have threatened my existence. They come, they comfort, they come for my family, and the stability of my people. I must fight for my survival, for our survival. I implore you to join me in battle, Ogun. Give me the strength to fight courageously. Shower me with your power. Endow me with the will to win. Allow me to vanquish my enemies and grant me the glory of victory. Ashe. That is the exact prayer, and of course, in their dialect that they uh that they prayed to Ogun before they went into battle with Napoleon. You see the result of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yes, I said the, early, that was real. <laughs> that culture system is very important. Very yes. important to us. It's the core of who we are. It's really what unified us mm -hmm. uh, to a degree. And I'm after, like this. Yeah, right. It's too many different... We were so diverse. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to comprehend. Um, 
-hmm. it was over eight thousand dialects on the continent right now. Right. Eight thousand. Eight thousand dialects, two hundred and fifty thousand different uh genetic uh variations. That it's it's incomprehensible to understand what it's like when what the diaspora actually did was reduce us down to the least common denominator. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's the worst thing that you could do to any any group of people is to reduce them down down having no history and symbolisms of history. So that, that's very important. And that's why the Orisha system must be kept intact, must be honored, and must be protected, along with our other African-based systems. So we really must understand that. Um, anything else you want to add, Brother Benjamin? Uh, shout out to Professor James Smalls, man. Uh, yes, Professor sir. James Smalls is very well versed in the Vodun. He dropped some jewels on me at the... Uh, at the science and technology conference that we had with the Amara squad in Atlanta, man. And, and the brother is just uh, well versed in that culture. So if anybody wants to learn more about voodoo, uh, definitely look up his videos. Uh, I know he has about a 45 minute one out on YouTube where he goes on the origin of voodoo. And if anybody's seen hidden colors too, he challenged any scholar, any scholar that did the, the uh, origins of every religion was rooted in Vodun, and he challenged any scholar to prove him wrong, and nobody came for him. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm gonna reach out to uh, to uh, Baba Smalls and see if we can have him on the show, man. Oh yeah, that'd be a blessing. A wonderful thing to kind of pick his brain for an hour, you know. Right, and if anybody's going to Ghana. The Asana Lodge, uh, Brother Leonard Jeffries and Brother James Smalls own that uh, hotel, and it's right in Ghana. So if anybody's going, look up that uh, hotel, the Asana Lodge, and uh, go stay with our Grand Masters. All they employ all the brothers from the continent. It's a nice hotel, so look them up. No doubt. Well, you know, I like to say that I think this was. A really good show. I think it really it it, it 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 gave you a perspective on what the Arisha system and the Netanu system really are. Um, and I'm sure they're going to be there. There are questions that we did not answer. Um, sometimes with a dynamic subject matter like this, you got to bring the questions to the table because it's so dynamic, and mm -hmm. that you 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 have to learn these systems every single day. In studying the Orisha system and the Netanu system, this is an everyday study for us. Mm -hmm. It's not like we study this system and say, all right, I got what I need. This is your everyday spiritual work. So this is what keeps you balanced. So you have to really study this every single day, and you become more proficient every day. So this is a living, moving thing. And when you get to understand that, you're able to create an intimate relationship with that science. And a lot of people don't. Don't really. They think it's like a a form of prayer. Mm -mm. <laughs> like you go so like that. Much this more. becomes this. This is you. Your inner, your expression. You. What What is your essence becomes this. So you walk with this. This becomes your spirit. So um, those who are interested and want to know more, you know, what I'm saying, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Reach out to Brother Benjamin on his Facebook page. What's your Facebook page, bro? Uh, Benjamin N J B E N J A M I N N J I spelled N J I E. If I got too many friends, you can't get to me. Uh, holla at us on the Team Osiris uh, web page. Uh, yes, just Team sir. Osiris. Find us on there and, and reach out to us on there, and I'll get to you. Same for me. Reach me if not reach out to the Team Osiris page. <clears throat> also, we're looking to come to a city near you. We, we, we're going to start branching out and lecturing and having workshops. We may even have a workshop similar, you know, breaking down the um, Orisha so that you can um, firsthand, you know, have an account and understanding of this wisdom and knowledge, man. We have no problem putting that work in, coming to see y'all. Um, Absolutely. I'm, I want to, you know, give thanks and praise to my ancestors, known and unknown. 
um, I want to appreciate um, the brother Benjamin taking time and giving his wisdom. I really appreciate it just, you know, uh, sitting and listening to the brother because we try to learn from one another too. So I'm very humble in that aspect. Um, definitely want to thank Ngozi. I don't know what Ngozi was doing. He must have been traveling or something. So I'm sure he cool. Um, so oh, I appreciate yeah. him stopping cool. Once again, arrows up. I'm a raw squad. Appreciate all you brothers. God, Killer on Kakek, Smash, sure. Sanjeti, Wajawu, Asa, um, whoever I forgot the name. There's so many of us, man. It's crazy. So, <laughs> thank all y'all. Like Voltron, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. I like to thank all you brothers for being really good, real brothers. You know, uh, checking us when we out of order. We don't have no problem checking each other either, y'all. It, it keeps us. It keeps us tight, man. Because you, you can't know everything. So we can debate each other. One and the same, and truthfully. From myself and Brother Benjamin, we appreciate all the listeners, all the supporters of, you know, Armin Ross Squad and Team Osiris. You are much appreciated. Much appreciated. Remember, man, we forgot Ishmael Bay, man. I got to shout yeah, him out. Ishmael Bay, I'm bogus. <laughs> man. Yes, sir, Brother Ishmael. I'm sorry. One of the founders, baby. Shouts out to Ishmael Bay, man. Man, don't, don't, don't send no hexes, man. My bad. <laughs> Yeah, my man. Yeah, peace to you, brother. So um, until next time, man, y'all, be peaceful, be prosperous. God manifest. Peace. Peace. RBG. All day.